Tzedi. What is the meaning of the Tzedi? The vowel Tzedi sounds like an A. Tzedi Aleph A. You put an a Tzedi under the Aleph. The Aleph sounds like A. Tzedi Beis Be, etc., etc. The Tzedi is also one of the kings of the vowels. It's a melech. In general, when we say that the vowel is a king, it means that the vowel is elongated. You put more emphasis on that letter. In contrast to a letter that has a vowel or a nakuda that is a slave, that the letter is shortened. The sound is shortened on that nakuda. And many times, a king will change to a slave, and a slave will change to a king depending on the sentence. So these two nukudas are usually interchangeable. So the tzede sounds like an A. What is the graphic design of the tzede? Two dots, one next to the other. And here the Zara tells us something very beautiful that these two dots allude to the sun and the moon. When God first created the world, it says he created the two great luminaries, the sun and the moon, and they were both equal. The sun gave light during the day, and the moon gave light during the night. What happened was the moon had a big mouth, and the moon told God, two kings cannot serve with one crown. So God said, you're right, diminish yourself. It's interesting that the Tzedei represents the king of the vowels, two kings, the sun and the moon. Later the Shiva represents how the moon became small. But now the moon is still big. The sun and the moon are equal. And both the sun and both the moon have a lesson for each and every one of us. And then the sun and the moon together have a lesson. What is the lesson of the sun? Primarily, the lesson of the sun is continuity. That every day we got to do the same thing. A yid gets up in the morning, he says, Moidani, he washes Negel Vassar. He davins, he eats, he studies Torah. He works, he gives charity. He prays Mincha, he prays Maidiv. Every day there is this continuity of the sun. The sun rises every day and sets every evening. It's consistent. The moon, however, represents change. Every day it waxes or it wanes. This alludes to the special mitzvahs that we do from time to time, like Shabbos, or the holidays, Purim, Pesach, Shavuos. These are the moons in Judaism. And then, the moon also gets bigger every day, alluding to the fact that a Jew has to continue every day to do more and more. What I did yesterday does not suffice for what I do today. So you could be brilliant and you could be successful and you could do everything 100%. But today is a new day. What I did yesterday is not enough for today. Today I must do more. And then the question arises after the 15th of the month, when the moon has waxed to its full glory, it starts to get smaller, begins to wane. So what's the lesson? Do we stop doing? So the Rebbe explains that this alludes to the concept of humility. If a person for 15 days continues to get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and more and more proficient, when he reaches day 15, he has a lot of arrogance. Look what I did over the last 15 days. So now you have to work on your humility to become smaller and smaller. And by becoming smaller, you give room for more growth and to acquire greater heights and greater greatness. However, this is the sun and the moon separately. How do we put it together into the Tzede, into one Nekuda? So we know that the Jewish calendar, even though it runs on the solar system, it runs according to the moon. At the same time, we have to balance it with the sun. In other words, a solar month is only 29 days. And every year we lose 11 days. If we would follow the Jewish calendar only according to the moon, so every year, we would be 11 days behind, and eventually Pesach, instead of falling out to be in the spring, would fall out to be in December. And Hanukkah, instead of December, would fall out to be in the spring. 
So for me, going on the cherry picker, a Hanukkah would be very good, it would be nice and warm. But the Torah says, Pesach has to be B'chodesh HaAviv. That Pesach has to fall out in the spring. And therefore, Torah tells us that God told Moses, the very first mitzvah, HaChodesh HaZel Lechem, that you are to know that every seven or seven times in 19 years, the Jewish people should have a leap year. And that is we add a whole additional month. And so you have 12 months and the 13th month. Adr 1 and Adr 2. What is the message of a Ibur year, of a leap year, which is called a pregnant year? The message is the message of tshuva. We can make up this year for that which we lacked over the last three years. Being that an average a leap year is once in three years. So that leap year you can make up for that year and the previous two years. In other words, normally you cannot turn back time. You can't go backwards. You can only go forwards. That is true within the physical world. When it comes to Torah, when it comes to Judaism, when it comes to God, then a person stands beyond time and space and actions that you do now can fix things that you did years before. Especially two years earlier. And of course even earlier than that. So the message of the leap year, which is the balancing of the sun together with the moon, is the message of tshuva. It's a shdokein farfalin. It's never too late. You can always change. You can always be better. And not only be better proactive now onward, but also you can fix the mistakes you've done in the past. That is the message of the tzedek, the concept of tshuva. I read recently that the Rebbe told a convert that they should, they should count their birthday from the day that they converted, because that is really their birth. And everything before that disappears. That is your birthday. That is the day you had your new soul, and that is the day, the day you started life all over again. So the concept of the sun and the moon coming together in the later, in the, in the Kuda of Tzedah, is the idea of tshuva. And this is also connected with the meaning of the Nakuda, the meaning of the Tzedah. What is the meaning of Tzedah? There are two basic meanings. Number one, it means bam. As we find in the famous verse in Jeremiah, is there no bomb in Gilad? In other words, the idea of tsari, which is bomb, is the substance for healing and medicine. What is the idea of healing and medicine? Says the Gemara, great is tshuva, great is repentance, for it brings remedy and healing to the world. So when a Jew does tshuva, in the leap year, by retroactively fixing the past, he actually brings true remedy into the world. And this connects us with the second meaning of Tzedah, which is brought down in the Tukunei Zoyar. And there they say that the letters of Tzedah are the same as Vayitzer, which means that God formed man to form. <coughs> to create, but even more than to create, to form in particular. Because the previous Nukodej is the Patach. The Patach is Chachma. Chachma is a concept, it's the letter Yud, it's a dat, it's an idea. It's the seminal drop. But Seide is Bina, as we'll soon see. It's to expound on it, it's to form and to develop this idea. We find that Ashi tells us that in the word of Vayitzer, and God for man, we find two letter Yuds, like the Tzede, which are two dots, implying that there was a creation, a forming in this world, and a forming that will take place through the resurrection of the dead. Again, implying the idea of tshuva, through studying the Torah and through following the mitzvahs. When Mashiach will come, we will have a reward for all the deeds that we did throughout our entire life. And the entire world at that time will come to tshuva, will come to return to God. 
And that connects us with the Safira, the attribute of the Tzedek, which is Bina. How do we see Bina, which is understanding, is connected with Tshuva? When a person understands the greatness of God, understands how the world is temporary, and here in this world nothing is real, but God is eternal, and God is absolute truth, a person realizes that they must put their efforts and all of their, their, their true love and, and, and connection to God and to Torah. And therefore, the Rebbe writes, and he gets us a tshuva in the Holy Tanya, in the section dealing with tshuva, chapter 9, he writes, and he quotes from the Zoya Kodesh and Tukunim, he says over there, that Bina, understanding, Ihi tshuva ila, alludes to the higher tshuva. For Bina and tshuva are synonymous. And what does the higher tshuva mean? The lower tshuva is, you regret the past. Or you do tshuva because you're afraid of punishment. So your sins turn into shagigin. Your sins turn into mistakes. And therefore you're not punished for it. However, the higher tshuva is a tshuva of love. You love God and therefore you want to return to God. And now your sins become mitzvos. They're transformed into good deeds. And therefore, the Alt Rebbe writes in chapter 9 of Yigayi Tshuva, what does that mean? How does a person live Tshuva Ila, this higher Tshuva? If he study one page of Talmud a day, he should study two pages of Talmud a day. If he study one chapter of Mishnah, he should study two chapters of Mishnah. In other words, the idea of Tshuva is not reactive, but rather proactive. I become a different person, I'm transformed. I am returning to my essence beyond time and space. And he goes on to give an example of a rope that is made up of 613 threads or strings. When a person sins, one of these mitzvahs, one of these little strings are torn, are severed. So now if a person, God forbid, violated the whole Torah, he did a sin for which he gets cut, he gets cut off from the Jewish people, God cuts the rope. Now you do tshuva, you repent, you return to God. God takes the rope and he knots the rope together. So now the rope is double as thick as it was before. So now you have a double connection. Your connection with God is stronger than ever before. Till now it was a single connection, now it's a double connection. And that's tshuva. And therefore says the Tzemach Tzedek that this, this nekuda, this vowel of the tzedah represents the yichud, the unity that takes place between the sun and the moon when, this, when once again the moon will be restored to its glory to be equal to the sun. And we know that that will take place when Mashiach will come. And as the Ramam says, it's all dependent upon our tshuva. When the Jewish people will do tshuva miyad Immediately, hey the Gullin, they're going to be redeemed. And all of this is connected with the sphere of Bina of understanding. When we wake up and we finally understand why we're here, when we finally understand the purpose of creation, when we finally understand our potential, then we'll have the ability to transform the whole world to make the world a dwelling place for God. And this is all connected with the Gematria. The gematria of Tzedei is 20. For each dot is like the letter Yud representing 10. So 10 and 10 is 20. What is 20? Says the Maggot of Mizrich, Asara Asara HaKaf. That the Kaf or the Kof, the Chof, which is the gematria of 20, the letter Chof, which equals 20, is really 10 and 10. What does that mean? What's the meaning behind this? Says the Maggot of Mezrich that this teaches us that the ten utterances of creation, the Asodim 
with ten utterances God created the world, parallel the ten commandments that God gave us on Sinai. In other words, the whole reason why God gave us the Ten Commandments on Sinai is in order to strengthen the ten utterances in which the world was created. And when a Jew studies Torah, and when the nations of the world will follow the Noahide laws, then we will strengthen the world and the world will be at peace. So 20 represents 10 plus 10, or 10 times 10. When the world, which was created with the ten utterance of creation, will follow the ten commandments, then you will have this perfection, then you will have tshuva. And ten times ten is a hundred, which represents perfection. There's a story, a teaching in the Talmud that I've mentioned numerous times. It's an amazing story. The Talmud says, what is the reason why the Jewish people sinned and made a golden calf? Forty days after they received the Ten Commandments on Sinai. In other words, God took them out of Egypt. They were slaves for 210 years. He, he created all of these amazing miracles. He protected them from the Ten Plagues. He split the Red Sea. He brought them to Sinai, they saw God face to face. After all of these miracles and after all of the kindness and benevolence that God wrought upon the Jewish people, what did they do? Forty days later, because Moshe Rabbeinu was a few hours late, they go and they deny the whole Torah. They build a golden calf and they spit God right in the face. Does it make sense? says the Gemara that it wasn't so simple, that Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to come back on the 40th day and they miscalculated. And they looked in the heavens and they saw how the Satan was confusing all of the heavens and there was dark clouds that hovered over the Jewish people and they saw in the clouds as if a procession was taking place in heaven and there was this big bed and Moses was lying on the bed and they were bringing Moses to his final resting place. And it makes sense. A man doesn't eat for 40 days or 40 nights. He's not going to be able to make it. And the Jew said, look, Moses died. We got to do something. We got to make a leader. We'll make a golden calf. All of this sounds very good, but still it makes no sense. How could it be that after everything, after all the miracles that God proved of his existence, the Jews would now go and deny and defy the entire Torah? Says the Gemara, a very powerful thing. One line that the reason all of this happened was to give the opening of the mouth for Balchuva, for one who returns to God. What does that mean? That a person in this generation, in the 21st century, will say, look, I did so many sins, I committed so many atrocities, I broke the Shabbos and I didn't eat kosher and I, did, uh, I violated this thing and that thing and I had a hamburger with cheese and all these terrible, terrible gefel chazach. There's no way God's going to take me back. I'm too far gone. I've done too many wrong things for many years. God doesn't like me anymore. He hates me. And no matter what I do, it's too late. I might as well live a life of, of hedonism and, and, and coarseness and, and violation. That's it. I'll eat today and uh, tomorrow I'll worry about it. Comes along the Torah and says, now look. There was never a greater time in history like the receiving of the Ten Commandments. Was there ever a time that the entire world heard God and saw God? No. And yet the entire Jewish nation stood together at the foot of Sinai. We saw God's revelation. We saw God speak to us. God saved us from slavery. And yet, what did we do? We didn't simply have a hamburger. We went and we created a golden calf. And publicly we sinned and violated the first two commandments. You would think God would never forgive us. It was the worst sin we can do. And we did it publicly. To do a sin in your closet is half a problem. To do a sin publicly, there's no way to do tshuva, there's no way to repent. And yet, 
What does God do? God says, I'll take you back as my nation. So if at this time when the Jews witnessed the greatest revelations and we committed the greatest atrocity, yet God was willing to accept our repentance, how much more so somebody who eats a hamburger with cheese in a closet that nobody sees it for sure, God's going to take you back. <laughs> so this is the message of the Seder. That we have to create balance in the world, the balance between the sun and the moon, which is the balance between Rotsi and Shuv to run to, to God and to return back into the world. And that is by living a life of consistency based on the Torah, but also to go beyond the letter of the law and not to rest on our laurels, but every day to increase and do more. And to do this with understanding through meditation and understanding of the greatness of God. And through this we bring ourselves and we bring the entire world to a true tshuva when the sun and the moon will once again be equal.